With my condemnation of Christianity, I should not like to have done an injustice to a kindred religion, which even preponderates in the number of its followers, to Buddhism. The two are related as nihilistic religions. They are decadence religions. Both are separated from one another in the most remarkable manner. For the fact that they can now be compared, the critic of Christianity is profoundly grateful to the Indian scholars. Buddhism is a hundred times more realistic than Christianity. It has, in its nature, the heritage of an objective and cool propounding of questions. It arrives after a philosophical movement lasting hundreds of years. The concept of God is already done away with when it arrives. Buddhism is the only properly positivistic religion which history shows us, even in its theory of perception, a strict phenomenalism. It no longer speaks of a struggle against sin, but, quite doing justice to actuality, it speaks of a struggle against suffering. It has, and this distinguishes it profoundly from Christianity, the self-deception of moral concepts behind it. It stands, in my language, beyond good and evil. The two physiological facts on which it rests, and which it has in view, are, on the one hand, an excessive excitability of sensibility, which expresses itself as a refined capacity for pain, and, on the other hand, an over-intellectualizing, an over-long preoccupation with concepts and logical procedures, through which the personal instinct has received damage to the advantage of the impersonal. Both are conditions which at least some of my readers, the objective ones, will know, like myself, by experience. On the basis of these physiological conditions, a state of depression has originated, against which Buddha takes hygienic measures. He applies life in the open air as a measure against it, wandering life, moderation and selection in food, precaution against all intoxicants, similarly precautions against all emotions which create bile or heat the blood, no anxiety either for self or for others. He requires ideas which either give repose or gaiety. He devises means for disaccustoming oneself from others. He understands goodness, benignity, as health-promoting. Prayer is excluded, as is asceticism, no categorical imperative, no compulsion at all, not even within the monastic community a person can leave it. These would all be means to strengthen that excessive excitability. For that reason, too, he does not require a struggle against those who think differently. His doctrine resists nothing so much as the feeling of revenge, of aversion, of resentment. Hostility does not come to an end by hostility, the moving refrain of the whole of Buddhism. And rightly so. These very emotions would be extremely unhealthy in respect to the main dietetic purpose. The intellectual fatigue which he highlights, and which is expressed in an excessive objectivity, that is, weakening of individual interest, loss of weight, of egotism, he combats by strictly redirecting even the most intellectual interests back to the individual. In the doctrine of Buddha, Egotism became duty, the one thing needful, the how are you freed from suffering, regulated and determined the whole intellectual diet. One may perhaps call to mind that Athenian who likewise waged war against pure scientificality, Socrates, who elevated personal egotism to morality even in the domain of problems. The prerequisite for Buddhism is a very mild climate, great gentleness and liberality in customs, no militarism, and that it is the higher and learned classes in whom the movement has its focus. Cheerfulness, tranquility, and absence of desire are wanted as the highest goal, and the goal is attained. Buddhism is not a religion in which perfection is merely aspired after. The perfect is the normal case. In Christianity, the instincts of the subjugated and suppressed come into the foreground. 
It is the lowest classes who seek their goal here. Here, the casuistry of sin, self-criticism, and inquisition of conscience are practiced as occupations, as expedients against boredom. Here, the emotion towards a powerful one, called God, is constantly maintained by prayer. Here, the highest things are regarded as unattainable, as gifts, as grace. Here, also, public openness is lacking. The hiding place, the dark chamber, are Christian. Here the body is despised, hygiene is repudiated as sensuality. The church even resists cleanliness. The first Christian regulation after the expulsion of the Moors was the closing of the public baths, of which Cordova alone possessed two hundred and seventy. A certain sense of cruelty towards self and others is Christian. The hatred against those thinking differently, the will to persecute. Gloomy and exciting concepts are in the foreground. The most greatly desired states, designated with the highest names, are epileptoid states. The diet is chosen so that it favors morbid phenomena and overexcites the nerves, the deadly hostility against the lords of the earth, the noble, and, at the same time, a concealed secret competition with them, one leaves them the body, one only wants the soul, are Christian. The hatred of intellect, of pride, courage, freedom, libertinage of intellect, is Christian. The hatred of the senses, of the delights of the senses, of all delight, is Christian. Christianity, when it left its first soil, the lowest classes, the underworld of the ancient world, when it went abroad, among the barbarian nations in quest of power, had no longer to presuppose weary men, but internally savage, self-lacerating men, strong but ill-constituted men. The discontentedness of man with himself, the suffering from himself, is not here an excessive excitability and capacity for pain, as it is in the case of Buddhists, but on the contrary, it is an overpowerful longing for causing pain, for discharging the inner tension in hostile actions and concepts. Christianity had need of barbarous notions and values in order to become master of barbarians. Examples of such are the sacrifice of firstborns, the blood drinking at the communion, the contempt of intellect and of culture, torture in all its forms, physical and non-physical, the great pomp of worship. Buddhism is a religion for late human beings, for kind, gentle races who have become over-intellectual and feel pain too readily. Europe is as yet far from being ripe for it. It leads them back to peace and cheerfulness, to an ordered diet in intellectual matters, to a certain hardening in physical matters. Christianity desires to become master of beasts of prey. Its expedient is to make them sick. Weakening is the Christian recipe for taming, for civilization. Buddhism is a religion for the end and the fatigue of civilization, which Christianity does not even find in existence, but which it may establish under certain conditions. Buddhism, to repeat once more, is a hundred times colder, sincerer, and more objective. It no longer needs to make its suffering, its capacity for pain, decent by the interpretation of sin. It simply says what it thinks, I suffer. For the barbarian, on the contrary, suffering in itself is no decent thing. He needs an explanation first, in order to confess to himself that he suffers. His instinct points him, rather, to the denial of suffering, to silent endurance.